two or three gathered as a series of conversations with Christian brothers and sisters, considering their efforts and contributions to the kingdom vocationally, their stories and testimony of God's sovereignty and grace, and an opportunity to tackle the relevant issues the church faces in the 21st century. In this, we seek to equip the saints by networking within the body, starting the conversation around often taboo subjects and seeking to develop unity across Christian denominations and traditions by opening up uh, discussion on worthy and necessary topics. We want to help educate the wider body of Christ by asking experts and people of wisdom across multiple fields the hot button questions and sophisticated questions that we believe there are answers for in Christ Church, but that there is not necessarily always access to. We want to further the growth of knowledge and wisdom in ourselves, to worship God with our minds and fellowship with all of you as we collectively seek to discern what God-glorifying discipleship looks like for us in our respective vocations and in our spheres of influence. It is our heart and hope that Christ himself would be in our midst as we converse about things we believe he himself is very interested in. Welcome to Zor Threes. Thank you for gathering with us. Uh, good day to you, The Gathered. Great to have you with us again. We have uh, our wonderful co-hosts and we have the immense privilege of having the the wonderful, the glorious, the powerful James Andrew Harris. Is that what we go as <laughs> the full title, James? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we're going for that tonight, I'll just, you know, let it slide. <laughs> you're, a forgi- you're, you're a forgiving man. You're a gracious man. Yeah. I've noticed that about you. <laughs> um james is one of those guys that actually he leaves an impression gives you the uh a model of actually christ likeness both and actually whoever gets to know him and actually anyone who knows about him there's just a clear sense of actually this is a man who is motivated by actually what it is to actually do christian ministry and how that it actually forms the orthopraxis of the believer um, to just give you a bit of uh, a bio, a bit of actually a space to tell you about actually who James is, um, James ha- has quite a bit of experience with youth work. Um, he is a former Zeal Wellington manager. Zeal is a uh, youth organization that actually focuses on, I mean, maybe James, you can tell us a little bit there actually what ha- is the work of Zeal, just in short. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, Zeal's a creative youth organization um, that is uh, the home of young misfits all around Aotearoa. And um, yeah, it's a place that people can find um, belonging. And yeah, it was an immense privilege to be a part of Zeal for quite a few years. Love that. And so uh, James has had work with the Wellington branch, uh, the West Auckland branch, also some, you know, of the more national uh, outreach as far as well. Um, he has previously been World Vision New Zealand's Community Engagement Manager, um, also had a bit, a bit of a stint in World Vision Jordan. Am I correct in saying that as well? Yeah, yeah, had the immense privilege of being based in Jordan um, in 2019. Um, mm. feel like it's one of my many places I call home is Jordan, <laughs> beautiful place. Mm. Um, James is also... Uh, in Anglicare, which is based out of Australia, uh, Western Australia 2021, he was the was a Youth Work Awards finalist. Um, so good to actually have some recognition for some of the stuff. I imagine part of that work, um, part of that recognition was part of actually your advocacy for the refugee release in Nauru, Australia. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it was separate um, separate things, but yeah, uh, so I... I uh was in Nauru for for two years and um maybe we'll get into this a bit later on Mm. Nauru is where Australia um hold their asylum seekers and um really pretty terrible place so while I was I had the privilege of being there which was amazing but then um once I left was a part of a successful campaign to um get the kids out of detention from there Mm. so um yeah that was um some of my the favorite things I've ever been a part of um was um seeing those people released. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and he also has a new role in 2022, which, uh, as he describes it, is mobilizing churches for social action across Australia. Um, but alongside these things, uh, he is, uh, to quote the Hebrew, I'd say, he's a connecto, can never say the actual <laughs> Hebrew for that well, um, alongside the likes of the powerful Jenna Harris, wonderful couple. These guys are actually doing great things for the kingdom of God in their space. He's a hardcore fan from way back. I um, think uh, those listeners who know the King's Arms, I imagine names like Dan Rush, Kent Hartman, Calvin Culverwell, and Marcus Mulder, they they ring some bells, James, for you. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, the, um, yeah, good friends and people that I got to go to many gigs alongside mm-hmm. over the days. And here this guy, I mean, he's seeming experiencing experience with coding, I mean, this guy's creating chatbots and information hubs. He's doing sneaky ninja interviews over beers with a news hub interview. So with Patrick Power <laughs> back in the day, <laughs> that's a great clip. We'll link that in the description as well. <laughs> um, not to mention as well, uh, the, you've also had a number of instances of traveling abroad. I loved reading the zine that you produced back in 2015 on the other whaling wall and about Palestine and Israel. Um, just a number of instances uh, where this man has actually is really motivated to promote and create things that actually challenge, provoke, uh, itch, you know, will actually encourage people towards actually deeper Christian discipleship. Now, there's lots of avenues that we could go down and will go down, hopefully tonight. I definitely want to plug uh, two podcasts that actually this uh, beautiful man has been involved in. We'll link those in the description afterwards. But I think at this point, it would be appropriate to actually do our intro. Uh, So, everybody, this is where we would pause. (laughs) I thought you was going to get me to say something because I don't know what to say. Yeah, Tony, I put (laughs) this on the minute. All good, no worries. Um, Jesus. <laughs> all right, um, so just giving a slight pause. Cool. Um, okay, everybody. So, firstly, James, we, we just actually, while well, giving that bio at the start of these various things that actually you've been involved in, one of the terms that I like to use is this idea of vocational ministry that premise of mm. wherever you go, you will carry the name of God. Um, you mm. will be Jesus's hands and feet. We are part of the body of Christ, wherever we are. So we mentioned a number of various roles and, you know, kingdom appointments. I just wondered if like, you know, rambling kind of conversation, if you could actually tell us about how God has led you both as a couple to have done mm. stuff that you've done. Um, maybe you want to tell us about your family and maybe you're coming to faith in Jesus or your marriage to Jenna first. Yeah any of those yeah for sure <laughs> mm. um yeah many many things to unpack and i'll try not to speak um too long about myself uh <laughs> but um yeah i guess i am a passionate follower of christ and when i think about i remember i don't know remember when i had this thought but it's just um guided my life since i um i've really thought since I kind of, I guess, had that revelation or whatever you want to call it, but I was like, I'm a follower of Christ. And I'm like, but where did Jesus actually go? Like, I think it's a term that's thrown around um, so often. I'm like, where did he actually go? It's like, oh, he went to the to the margins of society. Um, he went to the outskirts of the city and, um, and met with lepers. He went to um, Jacob's well in Samaria, um, as a place he wasn't supposed to be as a Jew middle of the day time that he wasn't supposed to go to go during to the well um and spoke to a woman that he wasn't supposed to speak to you know and um so in some ways my vocational ministry is kind of guided by that idea of um where did jesus go where did he actually go um and yeah went to the margins and so um that's really guided me and so for me, an easy way to get there, I ended up, um, I sort of fell into youth work and um, stayed in that lane for many years and feel like I'll be attached to youth work in some description, probably for the rest of my life. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, I worked for an amazing organization called Zeal. Um, Zeal does some amazing work. And then alongside that, at the same time, we met so many homeless young people, particularly in West Auckland. Um and as re- essentially a young person myself at the time, 
uh, it was really confronting. It was confronting that there was no alternative for them at the time. Uh, at the time, if you came out of care, you left state care at 17, um, but you can't legally sign a lease until 18. Um, so it's almost systemic homelessness. People just got put on a benefit at 17 mm-hmm. and kind of fend for yourself. And then the most of the homeless shelters wouldn't even start to 18 because it's not safe to have a child. Um, you know, like under law, it's like under 18. It's like they're still a child. Um, so the best place for most people to go was under the bridge. So we had, um, I don't even know how many, I I lived with some other youth workers at the time and I didn't even know how many young people we had stay with us um, over those years. And um, that was a really formative time for me going, actually, I'm giving up um, a room at my house and giving up all the food in the pantry and all those sorts of things. But in losing my life, I found it, you know, and um, yeah, it was just like a joyous, amazing, messy, beautiful time. Um, And I feel like I've kind of spent the rest of my life chasing the dragon a little bit going like that was that was amazing. You know, how can we do more, even more, like how can we do crazier stuff? Um, and so I just feel like I've just, that was the thread and I've just continued to pull on it. Um, so mm. yeah, worked for Zeal for quite a few years. Um, ended up working with Australia's asylum seekers and refugees um, who are, were locked in detention in a small Pacific Island called Nauru. So um, was with um, the Salvation Army and then saved the children um, there working alongside those refugees in detention and then that was like I'd met homeless people but I hadn't met stateless people before you know and that was a huge thing for me going this is homelessness on a whole other level and um was global homelessness um and so yeah I guess I felt um the time I spent in Nauru was almost like university for me like every day I learned something new And um, I was learning about the civil war in Sri Lanka and the amazing history of Persia and how it led into the revolution in Iran. Like I went in with, I knew nothing. I was a blank slate. And so it was an amazing opportunity to, um, to learn. And I think um, the situation there, people were really stripped of their dignity. So to be someone that was just simply sitting there going like, I want to know you, like, I want to know about, where you're from and your story and things I think um was the best thing I could do in that situation um so um I often and I'll try not to go off on too many tangents because we'll get into them later on uh another very guiding scripture for me is and for many people that are justice orientated is Matthew 25 Hmm. sheep and the goats um, but I think people get it wrong. Like people talk about going to be Jesus to the least of these. And I'm like, in that story, the, the prisoner, the stranger, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, you know, all these things, they were Jesus in the story. So it's like when, when people tell me like, oh, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm like, when was the last time you interacted with the least of these? Like, if you want to find Jesus, like I remember telling a friend, he's like, man, I just really, he was in ministry and he was like, I just don't know about this stuff anymore. Like, I really just am lost. Like, what should I do? And I was like, I think you should sell all your possessions and go to the home of the destitute and dying in Calcutta and then you'll meet the face of Jesus and those people that have come to die. Um, You know, like, um, like, and seriously, I'm just like, um as much like as as much as i feel like i maybe offered a tiny piece of dignity back in nauru um i got the chance to have that kind of mutual transformation and that experience i was like i i felt like i was um meeting jesus afresh and all these people so um yeah so it's a really transformative time for me and i feel like my whole life has just been continuing to pull on that thread um, so now what I'm doing is I work in, um, have recently started an awesome role where basically it's just, um, mobilizing and equipping and convening churches on social issues in Australia. Um, and the main one is, um, around refugee, um, resettlement and community sponsorship of refugees. So I sort of feel like I've landed in a dream position really for myself to be, um, continuing on, um, 
the legacy and journey that I started um, with those people in Nauru. So, um, yeah. And then I um, am married to my better half, Jenna, who almost everything I've mentioned, we did that whole journey together. We got married and went to Nauru like six weeks later. Um, so did a whole honeymoon essentially um, in Nauru together. She's incredible, um, incredibly intelligent, incredibly beautiful. Um, and we have... Um, an amazing little 13 month old son um who's just the light of my life i i i yeah people say you never fully understand it's who you're a parent but um i struggle to do anything else but like just chase him <laughs> around the house and read a book <laughs> <laughs> um and can i, I jump in please do. yeah of course sorry it was just um as i was listening to to your your journey i think for me it was um but going from stumbling into youth work to mobilizing a nation is is, is a journey. That's a that's a that's a um that's a path to follow and and following Christ. So my my question would be from the beginning mm-hmm. when you stumbled into it, how how much has your spirituality changed? Mm. Really good question. Uh 18 year old James survived on uh, a little bit of Red Bull and a little bit of Red Bull and the good feelings that came with my faith. Mm-hmm. Um, 32 year old James survives on moments of quiet contemplation. Um, when I was in Nauru, I tried desperately to find, I was like, I just need like a daily devotional that I can read and sustain me. And I ordered all the stuff and it was like, honestly, garbage, like just warm, fluffy, (laughs) fuzzy. Um, And one day I walked into an Anglican church during the middle of the day, sat down and picked up the book of common prayer. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, it's I genius. Was like, that yeah, book yeah. is genius. Yeah. Sorry. And... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, we, like, we we're just putting this out there. We're an ecumenical podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're ecumenical, but we share what's good from one denomination yes. to another. Amen. And yes, um Amen. and Honestly, all those devotionals, what I was looking for um, was the daily offices. Um, And so, yeah, um, I feel like... It freaked me out when I first got into it. I was just like, who wrote this? It's like like madness, but it somehow works really, really well. Yeah. 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 It's not a vanilla milkshake. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like, it's... (laughs) Um, I remember reading the Book of Common Prayer. Like, so I I picked it up. I'm sitting in this church. I deal with really hectic stuff day in day out. Like, I'm uh, uh holding some pretty heavy things. Yeah. Um, and so to go from essentially reading these devotionals and throwing them away, where it was like, God, everything is so beautiful. I don't know, whatever, whatever it was in it. It's like, that's true. That's totally true. But to have the book of common prayer that holds that alongside, I remember reading the first, um, one of the daily offices that's like, be with those who will die today. Mm. You know? And I was just like, yeah, like finally, (laughs) finally I can have some, like, I don't have to bring a prayer out of my own good feelings of the day. Mm. I have something mm. to scaffold me and mm. on a day that I don't feel like praying, I have something to lead me, mm. but also something that holds the beauty and the truth, but also some of the hard stuff um, mm. in prayer. I was just like, Oh man, this is, um, yeah, this is what I need. So yeah. You've yeah. answered me. Thank you, my man. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, Jared, you go ahead, my man. <laughs> oh, 
all Not good, all bad. good. <laughs> um, I think something like I mentioned earlier, like I really, if you want to, listeners, if you want to know about uh, James Nardi experience, I really recommend the Down to Earth podcast, which we'll link. Like James kind of got into quite a bit of detail as to what his experience was there. Um, something I haven't heard you speak a lot of it about, and I'm privy to this, James, having read your zine. Um, mm. If you could tell us a little bit about like the experience of the other Wailing Wall, like, um, mm. like I, I know your timeline, and to some degree, there's obviously yeah. there's you know, uh, you grew up in West Auckland. Your your family were involved with um, church. Your mum did this doctoral study. This is also on the Youth Ministry Misfits podcast. I'm plugging both of those mm. for these guys. <laughs> I don't know the host, but you know we're networking within the body right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but then there's obviously this time of you uh, came out of school and then you mm. uh, did youth work uh, that was like you know obviously recommended and encouraged by Zeal um mm. somewhere in that space you also marry your beautiful wife and somewhere mm. around about that time you make your trip i guess traveling as as a young couple over to palestine yeah. Is that correct yeah so um how that basically worked is my wife's this um incredible connector and uh grew up in the gold coast which is a beautiful city but is relatively homogenous and um one day she got talking with a shopkeeper in Surfers Paradise who was from Jordan and they just got along well and um, ended up chatting and he's like, I'm closing up my shop. It's like 1am. And he's like, but me and all the other store owners, we're all from like Jordan and Palestine mm-hmm. and we, we shut up shop and we go smoke shisha and hang out. So she, her group of friends became this group of like Arab men um, as like a eighteen, <laughs> as like an eighteen year old, and she would spend her Friday nights going to like smoke shisha with these these men from um, mostly from Jordan, some from Palestine, and um, so she got re- a real fascination with Arabic um, and with the Arab world, and so um, she did her own travel to the Middle East um, before um, we were married, and then um, we were on in Nauru together, learning little bits of different languages every day. Um, you know, like learning how to, it's like when you run out of conversation with someone that doesn't speak the same language as you going, how do I count to 10 in this language is such a a great way to just keep your interaction going. So I felt like I can't learn to count to 10 in like 20 different languages. (laughs) Um, But it got to a point where it was like, we need to pick one of these and actually learn it. Um, And Jenna had all this history already with Arabic um, and, like man we just got to pick one of these languages and arabic seemed to make the most sense um and it was like oh where are we gonna like let's go to the middle east and study it um and so we looked for places to study arabic and the cheapest place we found there's two options that were most affordable one was egypt but the revolution was happening at the time and the egyptian dialect is kind of like learning to speak English in like Hollywood or something, you know, like it's quite <laughs> like, yo man, what's up? You know, the kind of <laughs> Arabic. Um, so we're like, oh, maybe it's not the, whereas uh, Levantine Arabic, the dialect in Palestine, Jordan, Syria um, and Lebanon is kind of a bit more classical and understood everywhere and things like that. So, um, and the, the other cheapest option was Palestine and we're like, we always wanted to go to Palestine anyway. So it um, just became, it was like, okay, two birds with one stone. Let's go live in the West Bank for a little bit and study Arabic. So um, while we went there, we, yeah, we learned, um, I guess, a whole lot about the experience of, of Palestinian people. Um, we engaged with the very deep nuance that comes with, um, the situation and um, I think that's one of the things I'm most passionate about particularly in Christian settings is um, is not forcing like I don't want people to come away from a conversation and go now I'm pro-Palestine it's like no let's let's engage with this as like how can we be 
honoring the image of God and all people and acknowledge that um, mm, the the systems, the way that they're set up, um, don't acknowledge the humanity and the image of God in a lot of people. Mm. Um, and I think in return, sometimes that's mirrored back, you know, and, and so that's where it's like, man, we need to engage with the nuance of the situation. Um, but yeah, we had the absolute privilege of, um, of meeting so many Palestinian people, a lot of Palestinian Christians, a lot of Muslims, um, and yeah, just seeing what daily life was like there. So, um, an immense, immense privilege, um, to be there, but also, um, something that's really confronting and something I'll hold with me, um, for the rest of my life. Yeah. People I consider, consider dear friends. And one of the crazy things. So after, after that, I wrote a, um, we'll get into hardcore punk soon, like <laughs> in the kind of hardcore punk scene, people talk about writing like magazines or like zines, like there's like fanzines or like a big thing. Like people essentially, it was just like DIY media um, started in you know seventies, eighties, people writing their own little like magazines that they would distribute and sell, um, you know, profiling little bands and things like that. And um, so I was like, oh, I'll, what am I going to do about this? I'm like, oh, I'll just write a zine about my time. So I wrote the zine called The Other Wailing War, which is, I know, like 8,000 words about my time in Palestine. And um, uh, talking about the zine, why am I talking about the zine? Well, can I can I jump in? Well, yeah. maybe it might get yeah, in your yeah, thoughts yeah, sure. again. Like, I, I remember reading that um, by, uh, I think it was Maddie Ireland who gave yeah. it to yeah, uh, my dear, yeah, my dear wife, uh, Stephanie, uh, was Bailey now Grant. Um, mm. Yeah. And uh, she, I mean, like I study via labor and did mm. the uh, majority world theology paper. And when the mm. topic of Palestine came up, I remember <laughs> reading that zine in 2016 being like, oh man, just the way this comes across and just leaps off the page just an inherent idea of actually mm. you got to understand the standpoint epistemology of people to actually have a respect for the imago day in your brother and your sister actually yeah sense, you know like it just uh, it stuck with me struck me so yeah. profoundly and it annoys me because i've looked any number of times trying to find that particular scene again uh, it's so hard to find yeah <laughs> i found a i know i made like a uh, hundred and 50 copies or something and then mm. i have like i don't even know if i could find a copy now but um, <laughs> but i have a pdf if you're on the pdf i managed to track that down Love the other that. day i that was, was trying to find it and i was like um what i was gonna say was that um uh and i guess you talked about that idea of idea of standpoint epistemology mm. um I think it's like seeing the situation through the eyes of how people are affected. Um, and 100% people are affected on the um, Israeli side, but it's the same on the other side. And I think mm -hmm. what, um, what is an issue, a massive issue is that it's like, now that I understand the Palestinian side, I'll stop listening to the Israeli side. Once I understand yeah. the Israeli side, I'll stop, you know, and I, that, that's yeah. a, that's a massive, massive issue. Um, but I think the, the one of the crazy things about um, that is one of the central stories in in the other wailing wall is this guy Hashem, um, who lives in in, in Hebron, um, and he showed us around his his world and his life, um, and that was 2014. The crazy thing is that um, a couple of years later, he um, and yeah, a couple of years later. Um, fights broke out in his village and he got tear gassed and that brought on a heart attack, but um, ambulances aren't allowed into his um, street because it's well, Palestinian ambulances, I should say. Um, and they weren't able to get him through a military checkpoint to the ambulance on the other side in time. So Hashem um, unfortunately passed away. Um, and I think that's the reality of, um, of so many people um, in, in Palestine. So um yeah, I just wanted to, I guess, honor the life of, of Hashem, but mm. go like that's the, um, mm. was the power of going there was going to meet people and hear their stories and, um, yeah, engage with that going, the image of God is in you and how can I, how can I see that and honor that and continue to honor that um, once I've left.
Mm. You and I, we, we, we've known each other through, uh, through a, a few mediums as we were discussing before we hopped on the, on the mm. cast, um, mostly through, through the vineyard church, kind of intermingling youth groups and a little bit of a hardcore scene. Um, mm. Can, can you tell us a bit more about that? Hmm. And yes, and hey, while, while while James is gathering his thoughts, if you two just yeah. want to talk about hardcore for the next ten minutes, and we and Tony can just walk off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> I, I, I have been. I have been. I've mostly been doing Midwest emo lately, but um. Oh, oh Midwest <laughs> emo! What yeah. have you been listening to? Hotel books. Um. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, American, American football. football. Oh, football. Yeah. Oh man, America! They are like to me. They are like God tier. Um, or maybe I shouldn't say that on a Christian podcast. They are, um, <laughs> they are S tier. Yeah, Midwest emo. They are good. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh, uh, just, uh, just. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's just scrolling <laughs> Facebook over there. No, I don't, I don't, I'm not on that. But I was just thinking, who are they on about? <laughs> Uh, it's basically I, look, a bunch of kids who were back in the in the old emo days, you know, Hawthorne Heights, Taking Back Sunday, MCR, the sorry, classics. Can I just, when are the old emo days? <laughs> mid mid to late two thousands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, alrighty, I'm... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm like the late eighties. Yeah, but before before <laughs> smartphones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and then those kids, some of them grew up and grew out of the depression. Some of us, you know, our our um, mental illnesses stuck with us, and um, those who were musical uh, are channeled that best. through Midwest emo, which was uh, mm. just oh, gee, better me. musically. <laughs> um, but, yeah, still, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Listen, Brian. you can't, you can't, you can't have that movement without the punk movement. You need the Sex Pistols, you need the Ramones, you know. Like oh the, yeah, of course. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I've spent. No, it's cool. It's just when somebody said growing out of depression. <laughs> <laughs> they were around in the nineteen thirties. In the depression. No, depre- <laughs> Sorry, the MySpace depression, depression that we had. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the MySpace yeah. depression. It was a different, um, okay. different type of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, about oh the eighties. The eighties is all I've been listening to recently. Is um, really, yeah. Just I had this realization, but it that, was cool. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> I had this realization that <laughs> there's so much of that influence what I love, mm-hmm. um, and so the the defining era of hardcore punk and metal music really is the the 1990s like everything came together in the 90s and like late 80s was like building towards it um but i had this realization that like there were things that influenced that you know what like what were what were the 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 big things like and you know the the one of the big things is like the invention of the d beat like in hardcore which is like duka, 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 like this fast kind of punk beat and it was this band dis- discharge from this um from the uk um and so that they call it i've always called it a d beat but um i never knew that it came from like the discharge beat you know it's like d for discharge and i've just been like dig i've just been like ah oh, the 80s is the best recently just listening to all this like 80s 80s punk basically and crossover thrash and all, all the goodies that the 80s has to offer sorry i was around i was born in this <laughs> i was around when the first punks rocked up and i remember <laughs> man i just remember them all just walking around when i was i was just like nine <laughs> years old or whatever yeah yeah they were with all of their super glued <laughs> mohawks and, yes i love yeah, that na- yeah names like triffid and things like that and you couldn't call it <laughs> up, and it was just like yeah, big gym and triffid and, like, and yeah, our key yeah. patches everywhere yeah <laughs> don't mess with you- the gym yeah what well, gym what were you listening to tony then? me back then yeah. um so my family was stones and the beatles so i got out of that yeah, nice. by the police um mm-hmm. which is pretty ironic for me considering they <laughs> take over most of my teenage years as well but not the band the actual um the force um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you jesus yeah, yeah. amen <laughs> amen 
but sorry, yeah, Caleb, you're asking that excellent question. Uh... <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, uh, may, may, team, yeah, yeah <laughs> maybe I should rephrase to what we what we had here. Um, you know, your, your work at Zeal and your own passion for music, you know, that that is mm. blatantly evident. You know, even just with this brief discussion, you know, yeah, it seems to hint at a high placed importance in the role of art yeah. for human flourishing. Um, mm. is, is, is would you say that's yeah. right or? uh yeah definitely and everyone just has what resonates with them you know like i got friends that just love visual art you know and they'll just spend yeah. their life drawing and looking at paintings and things like that i'll see paintings and i'll be like oh that's cool yeah, like, and i just don't cool. yeah yeah I, yeah I see it there tony yeah he painted um, that he painted that by the way yeah i love that oh nice <laughs> um Great. i love that followed by the statement that visual art just doesn't resonate with me the same way that music does and i think everyone has you know like i feel i feel like people have like mediums that they just like love and connect with them and um for me it's always been music and um i've always loved the kind of the edginess and like i'm thinking back to being 11 and 12 and my brother playing punk records and me liking that it was like a little bit dangerous like as an 11 year old it felt a little bit yeah. dangerous yeah. um people yelling um and things like that and uh and then yeah it just drew me in deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and now i'm at the point that it, i my so my I, I met my wife through heavy music um so we bond greatly over it and the other day i was talking about how when you finish being a teenager it's really good to individuate from your parents and go i'm my own person that stands on my own two feet and i can pay my own bills and my identity is separate from my parents but then there's a point where it's healthy to come back into the family you know and um and connect as an adult and i was talking to her about the parallel journey i had of like when i was a teenager like music was like everything like i had you know, like my faith as well but like um music just like was my world and then i became an adult and i had i individuated you know i kind of went actually my identity is not this um but now i'm in my 30s and i'm like i love this like i spend almost every moment of every day picking like the perfect song for this current mood um you know like i'm just like i'm always like it's music and i love the law that comes with it like we're talking about midwest emo i'm like some people could talk about like the folklore that comes with like a certain like tv franchise or like books or like whatever it is like i could talk about the folklore of like different subgenres, like I, for hours like i could spend the rest of my life doing that um so yeah i just i love it i absolutely love it but um i kind of have parallel journeys that i feel like uh came together at a point and so i was showing my age tony i was um 12 or 13 when the u.s invaded iraq and i remember um like i remember well i guess 9 11 happening prior and my parents saying one day as an adult you'll understand how significant this was mm -hmm. and then um similarly the uh, iraq being invaded and then very very soon after that like um george w bush was campaigning for a second term and so a lot of punk bands turned their attention to how can we stop a re-election and um this band anti-flag put out an album called his terror state which my brother got when i was like 12 or 13 i remember sitting reading the liner notes so like they have the song and then they have like this is like just more context that we have to say and it's just them talking about basically um the imperialism of the u.s army and all this stuff and so as a 12 13 year old it kind of captivated me like i was just like it was the first time i really engaged with what was happening in the world mm -hmm. um and it was connected to the music i loved the songs um so i felt like i dug deeper and deeper into the music um but deeper and deeper into what it was all about um and 
punk rock started as a movement that was kind of like a a bit of a nihilistic f u to the world but very quickly moved from like nihilistic drinking and drugs trying to escape the world to like probably nihilistic trying to <laughs> still nihilistic in many ways um trying to engage with what was happening in the world and so like that was what really gripped me and then um they were the parallel journeys i'd go to church on a sunday and hear about um the power of the crucifixion and the kingdom of god and then i would go to a hardcore show on a friday or saturday and hear about um like consumerism and uh I, I, it was the first times i started questioning like my diet and the impact on the, of it on the planet or like mm. the clothes i was wearing and who made them you know like someone had to make them you know like all those sorts of things mm. i wasn't getting that at church i was getting that from these like agnostic um hardcore punk bands on a friday and saturday night and so like i had these parallel journeys that i feel like converged at a point where i what at what when i basically like one day i read matthew 25 and i was just like oh we're talking about the same stuff you know it's just mm. it's not being talked about on a sunday for some reason you know i'm um, yes. so yes. um yeah so it's super important to me and like um for any people here that any listeners that are really into like sub genres like metal and and punk came from different trees like they're different they're very different and if you listen to like punk the difference in different in origin you listen to a lot of bands now they sound really similar um and what some of the early punks talked about when metal was happening was like in punk rock we were talking about like what was happening in the world like you turn on your tv and you see like you see a, a, another famine in another country or whatever it is um whereas metal was all almost like escapism in some ways like talking about even like talking about satan and things like that it's talking about like a mystical stuff talking about dragons and crazy you know like um all this like metal was all and so i kind of pushed away i listened to heavy music on the punk tree but like metal music i was like oh it's escapism you know like it's even you know it's talking about like dragons and random stuff and now i'm in my 30s and i'm like i love that stuff like I need, yeah. I need to escape. I'm going to listen to a corpse grinder album that talks about like throwing someone into an acid vat. I'm like, I'm into that, you know, like yeah, <laughs> anything, anything to forget the day I just had. Yeah. Um, not actually, but um, yeah, now I just love the breadth of it. I just like music. I love music, but heavy music, just there's something about it that draws me in. Mm. Nothing so, beats uh... finishing off a, finishing off a meeting at work with a 20 second grind core album. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The whole album's twenty seconds, not just a yeah, song. That's like, that's yeah. Nuts. That's, for those of you who aren't who aren't familiar with it, just yeah, look look up some some grindcore. Um, yeah, go listen to No Palm Death. Yeah. Um, something I'm I'm kind of curious about there is like, I I remember like you know <laughs> being at college with the likes of um, uh, Kent Hartman. Who yeah. you know fronted a lead us forth for a while. I don't know if that rings mm. a bell, James. Yeah, um, great band. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, not not uh they finished up a little while ago, but like um I remember talking to him about it and then like around about the same time hearing the song Hush Yael by O Sleeper, and just like mm. Kent framing it in terms of like hardcore is a space for holy rage. You know, yeah. like it's actually, yeah, it's yeah, a context yeah. where actually, you know, you actually can speak to, you know, we talk about happy in church, we talk about worship, you know, it's like yeah. necessary, important, you know, mm, what about the mm, space mm. of actually where we can actually vent God is angry about this and this is awful and this is the effects of sin on the world, you know, there needs to be a space for that. And I, I remember Kent <sighs> framing it that way to be like, yeah, um, but so I'm, I'm curious there, like um, seeing art as like, it's beautiful, but it can be provocative. I wonder if you can tease that a little bit of like, what do you see as the roles of mediums and why therefore yeah. should all Christians be invested in art? I like what you yeah, said about yeah, like, yeah. you know, you've got your interests between the four of us. We've got four different areas of interest. It's like, I wonder if there's a space for apologetics, you know, all things pointing to Christ in each of our respective interests there. But 
you know forgive me i'm, I'm yeah I'm yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um there's two things and i'm going to get to the second thing which is i guess around like christian art which i'll park and come back to it thank you you can leave that one. <laughs> you can leave that. No, I, I love. I, I do love some Christian art. Some, yeah, some, some. And um, I think one thing is just that, like, and you know, as cheesy it is, it's like as it is, it's like God was the creator, and He's made us to create. You know, like to 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 live in His okay. images to create. Yeah. Um, and I think we, um. Yeah, we create things that um, that express who we are and what we're feeling and what we're going through. And um, like I, on a another side, like I love writing. Like I, I really love writing and reading and um, and other people. And like to me, that's where like I feel like I learn and I grow. And even like writing i feel like i process my thoughts and things like that whereas i have friends that like they're like oh all i need to do is like go for a bush walk and take a photo of a leaf and contemplate like oh you know like if, you know everyone has their thing um but i think the amazing thing with creating is then once you create something it can provoke something else in someone else you know and like you can either draw people into the feeling that or reflection that guided your art or um, it can lead people down a different path. And I think that's amazing. Like I'm like, we're, we're made to do that. And from like a missional perspective, working with young people that like 99 out of a hundred weren't from a church context at all. Like it never stepped into a church before, mm -hmm. but was based around creativity. I'm like, Oh, we're getting young people to create and creating's in the image of God. And they're doing something that they were, built to do you know and 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 in creating we get to talk about creation and the world and like our place within it and you know like to me i'm just like oh like art is um is everything in some ways like i'm like oh if everything if the world was completely the way it ought to be we'd probably still make art you know like we would sing mm -hmm. songs to god and we would, would create would make paintings and i don't know like we'd do um but the world is not the way it ought to be. And so, so art also expresses that. And I think that's really important. Um, and you only have to read the Psalms to, um, to see things like lament and, um, you know, like expressing God, yeah. where are you in this? And, um, and that's where getting to the yeah. thing of Christian art, um, there's like a whole industry of Christian music and I just don't know if it's like complete bull crap or not, you know, like, um, it's, it's, it's almost like if, if anything, whatever it is, whatever it is mm. in life, if it can lead you into the presence of God, in you mm. and around you it doesn't matter what it is whether it's a christian has sung it or not if you're experiencing it in your life but it takes you beyond yourself into the realms of christ mm. that that's what i want that's that yeah. whatever whatever the medium is yeah. that's what yeah. i want to experience and so some christian music and some yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's that, it's that, Whatever. it's that. You can't get yeah. me there. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's that common yeah, yeah. grace. Yeah. It's that common grace that we find in, in yeah. many facets mm. of life. Um, you know, like, and, and I, I'm, there, there's a lot of discussion around what is Christian music. You know, I, yeah. I grew up like, like you, um, going to Parachute, you know, every year. Yeah. Parachute yeah. Christian yeah. Music Festival. And mm -hmm. Mark De Jong, who head who uh, heads up still parachute music, um, you know there would I remember just seeing a lot of discussions because for a time my mum was actually his PA. There were a mm. lot of discussions um, around is Christian music a thing or is it music by Christians or is it you know yeah, and, and it's yeah, pretty yeah, much yeah. like I mean 
yes and no. Um, yeah. It's it's like, it, is there such a thing as Christian plumbing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, does I the, think this... Sorry. Yeah. No, I was, I was just going to, like, I'm teasing. Um, does this just strike at the heart of, like, you know, Matthew 5, salt and light, you know, being in the world but not of it, right? Because it's like, mm-hmm. when I see Christians being like, let's create a subculture that kind of withdraws away, like that's there's a lot of merits to monasticism for example mm. right? i was talking about yeah, this in a yeah. class today but like that's part of the the fault of it is that it, it draws away when actually we're called to be in the world also mm. like yeah i wonder if that's part of the, the critique on it i suppose as well yeah um yeah totally and but i think where i got to is i was like i go to a hardcore show on a Friday or Saturday night because it challenges me about my place in the world and it um, yeah. and it pushes me deeper into engaging with the pain um, and suffering mm, around me. It doesn't mm. try, it anesthetize me from it. it yeah, that's um, good. Instead, it pushes my face deep into it and goes, what are you going to do about it? Mm. Um, but for the most part, even Christian hardcore bands just said what I heard on a Sunday. And I was like, I get that on a Sunday. I don't need to hear it from you. You know, and... Um, mm. Yeah, like, although although I, I guess you could say that they were there in some ways for those who who weren't hearing it on Sunday as well. Yeah, yeah, like totally. I guess for me as a Christian, I'm like, I've heard this, but like then, like I like, and I'm not questioning Christian bands in the hardcore scene or anything like that. But I think about say one of my favorite bands, Trapped Under Ice, not a Christian band at all. In fact, really opposite. Mm. Um and they have this song called Sea God, amazing song. And like, so the lyrics towards the end of the song is, and if you see God, tell him that I'm still alive. Gave up on those prayers because they couldn't provide the answers to the questions I've been asking since birth. And like, he's saying like, oh man, like all these people talking about God, like, man, if you see him, tell him like, I haven't heard an answer to my prayers. And to me i hear that like i listen to that song and i feel like i'm reading the start of a psalm yeah. you know and this is a this is a band that yeah. like is saying this to be anti-faith but to me it like draws me into like yeah. god 100 the, the the like this is the people i walk alongside daily like the the yeah the 17 year old living under a bridge or the refugee that's been forced out from from their country and now they're living in a refugee camp in jordan mm. They're not saying, like, God, you are so good and I'm going to write a song about how good you are. It's like, man, if you see God, tell him I'm pissed off at him. You know, and, like, yeah. to me, that's, like, the start of an authentic conversation about faith. Yeah. Mm. Starting yeah, with, like, like you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's yeah, where sure. I think it's kind of inauthentic for, and I don't want, I, I reckon we should move past the conversation about should there be Christian high school bands and Christian music. But I think my thing there is, like, Christian bands coming into that space and then going, oh, we've got the hope of the gospel. It's like, I think it's the more authentic thing within that culture is to say, we have a God that suffered. You know, like, and that is engaging mm-hmm. with the suffering. Like, that is more authentic um, yeah. to the culture that you're you're within. And so um, it's not saying don't talk about Jesus at all. It's just like, and not, and don't not talk about hope and all those things, but like, if if you're if you're coming into that culture which is built on rubbing your face and and never looking away from the pain of the world yeah don't lead with hope you lead with like lament the way that oh my gosh, you know, hold a third on a of the psalms back, do back up hold on so are you trying to persuade me that jesus likes this <laughs> 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 I think he might. <laughs> Jesus was a part. I think he might. Oh, no, 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 no. Jesus, come yeah. over here. We can listen to some car music, yeah. my man. Yeah, yeah. I reckon no, no, that's yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's. I I really resonate with that one there, James. Because I mean, you, you're reminding me with that song. I don't know if you guys know Hobson, um, the rapper. He was kind of in and out of christian faith and last i checked out um mm. and you're thinking you're like ill mind six 
Il Mine Seven, yeah. Yeah. So Il Mine Seven, yeah. seven uh, he he has these series of songs, um, Il mm. Mind of Hobson and Seven, he it's just it, it, it's a really yeah, it, it's a lamentation of sorts. Like it, it's just him mm. being angry. It's almost with like God, God is um, meeting people at different places in life. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> most of the world lives in in bad places. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, fortunately, yeah. in one way, for some reason or another, I'm in this place, and it's like, well. Hey, there's struggles. There are struggles. Mm. It's not the struggles of, yeah. of most. Um, yeah. Just I've I've experienced the pain in the past, but for some mm. reason I am in this position, so I don't. Yeah. I'm not screaming at the world anymore, and the world is yeah. is not really screaming at me because my house and my bank account protect me. Yeah, yeah. and uh, one sense. of the really interesting things is some neuroscientists um, did some like brain scans or like did this research on people listen to heavy music and they found that people that listen to pop music are more likely to be angry people because yeah. they are using music like to just almost just be like oh such a hard day oh listen to this happy song i'm gonna try to be happy yeah whereas like people that listen to heavy music it's like let's engage with these feelings and then we can move mm-hmm. past it and you know so it's um it's really yeah. it's interesting go to work, anyway go to, go to a hard i could talk show. about this for yeah. like this could be the entire podcast, and I yeah. feel like there's, um, yeah. there's we'll, more we'll move on. more to me than the music I listen to. So we, yeah. we'll do that. let's yeah. move on nah. to social yeah. justice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll we'll do a quick um. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. We'll move on to social justice. Yeah. Um. I mean, there there, there are a lot of the, it's it's a word a phrase that sets a lot of people off uh in good ways and in bad mm. um you know people some people say social justice isn't a thing which is weird um there, there are many facets of justice um mm. you, you but yeah you when it comes to social justice you've got the whole uh you know, in, in recent years, a lot of things that come to mind are things like BLM and um, CRT, you know, critical race theory and um, mm. cancel culture and uh, think, you know, big buzzwords, colonization and th- things that are important to talk about. Um, what what makes you, what, what do you think, James, is, is something that makes these things so polarizing? polarizing yeah um uh, as cheeky as it sounds i think like because it demands something of you mm. mm-hmm. yeah like mm. you know like i don't want to talk about um white privilege because if i actually engage with it then maybe i have to consider speaking less and listening more um you know like yeah. like i think that's a all part the of white it. guys are gone quiet <laughs> yeah, yeah well all four of us um yeah uh <laughs> but do, do you know what i mean like there mm-hmm. there's there's that's an element to it is um is it's it, it's challenging and it's supposed to be challenging and it's um it's confronting and it's supposed to be confronting yeah. uh that's one part of it um the other thing is that just like people hate nuance for some reason and i'm like god yeah. exists in the in the in the beautiful murkiness of life and the opposing truths and um and i think like similarly like me talking about israel and palestine the the biggest reason i struggle to talk about palestine is that people automatically think that that means that i think um uh jewish people are bad or that like the desire for a jewish homeland is um is inherently a bad thing or you know like i'm just like Mm. oh like we we can engage with the nuance in this discussion but where um where the polarization comes is people are just like like removing all sorts all nuance 
Yeah. Um, but I think that's where, um, yeah, we need to learn to have discussions again. And I, I think the the problem perpetuated by the internet is that, and like I'll um, out myself of, as a lefty if people haven't already um, um, picked that from this discussion. <gasps> the prob- the, oh, you're out. The problem, you're out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm out of the closet as a lefty. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the biggest detriment to, to the left is themselves. And um, hmm. the, um, the biggest thing is just that, the closing down of discussion. And not being able to, um, for not having the chance for people to ask dumb questions or not having the chance to value um, opposing truths. Because I think truths often come in two and they sit opposing each other, which is another mm. theological discussion to have. But, um, well, it's, it's like the scandal. Well, maybe it's right? part of it. Well, it's like the scandal of grace is that, mm. you know, Jesus is for the Pharisees as much as for the Samaritan. You know, like it's mm-hmm. the, we're, these othering that we do, that people do. God is for people; He's for all people. You know, like, and we we don't like that. I'm not trying to be overly simplistic, but I feel mm. like sometimes, you know, the basics of Christ is for the Palestinian and the Jew. Christ yeah. is mm. for the right, the person on the right, and the person on the left. Like, mm. that's what we love, and we don't like at the same time. You know. <laughs> Mm. Mm. yeah yeah i it's there's so many things like even talking about like say like when we talk about social justice and the gospel people often bring up like um you know works and grace like that whole Mm. that whole thing and then often is quoted you know like we're not saved by grace through faith you know we're so you know like like that verse in Mm -hmm. ephesians but then it's like verse 10 is like for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Yeah. So like the verse of, that everyone quotes about, it's all about grace. Like it's about, it's not about works so that no one can boast. Everyone like that's the, that's the verse that people use. But then like the next verse is where we're saved by grace through faith yeah. to do good works, you know? So like, yeah. again, it's like the opposing truths of it. Like it's, um, and so like I remember someone saying that like a barking doesn't make you a dog, but a dog should bark. Like if you're real, if you're really living life under grace, you should care about this stuff. And, um, and if you look at Matthew 25, what I, I, I just find so much gold in there. I can, you keep digging, you'd see more and more in there. And like, one of the things with that is like, Jesus condemns the goats and he says, you know, I was hungry. You didn't give me something to eat. I was thirsty. You didn't give me a drink. I was in prison. You didn't visit me. All those things. And they say, where did, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? But the sheep respond the same way. The sheep say, when did we see we hung- you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? It's not like they went, we're going to go look for the least of these and try do some good works. You know, they were, they were transformed and lived out of their nature as a sheep mm-hmm. and out of that nature, they did those things. Yeah. You know, and that's where like I think... don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And, he, and, and so that's what... that from the cross, forgive them father. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> it's like, yeah. we're, just, we're just wandering through life, trying our best yeah. um, to follow Christ that we in many ways don't really know. Um, we don't know Christ to the full extent. We just know whatever God has revealed to us yeah. through one another, through scripture, the journey that we've gone on. But yeah, mm. I hear what you're saying. I, I disagree in some ways with, with what you said that you're, you're on the left because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get into the gray zone. Into, yeah. Yeah. Into me somewhere in the middle and say, Hey, there is nuance here. And I think people are scared to yeah. walk out of that those light or dark however you want to name them mm. but those experiences are, are meat yeah. well, like the the, vin- the vineyard often talks about like the quest for the radical middle middle right yeah and, and pe- yeah, people yeah. hate centrism that's like oh you're neither hot nor cold you're lukewarm or yeah. something <laughs> out you know yeah, like, yeah. Well, centrism yeah, yeah, just yeah. means you're closeted right wings so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i 
the the reality is that like i um i agree i agree that i'm trying to find the nuance mm. but in that nuance there are some radical ideas do you, like, you know what I mean? Like you, you're you, just like, coming not... into the the center ground to drag us over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm not trying to explore, like, say, Israel and Palestine. In the in the in the nuance of um, of exploring the Israeli experience and exploring the Jewish experience. I still want to dismantle the settlements in the West Bank. I still want to end the blockade on Gaza. I, you know, like I, there's a whole lot of other things that I want to do that, mm. um, you know, but like the exploring the nuance and the murky gray um, doesn't mean submitting things to like murky gray. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, it's, it's just acknowledging that there are, there's, there's truth on all sides and let's like explore what that means. And one truth doesn't cancel another. It just means one truth has to begin to discuss mm. what that means for each other. And um, yeah, but that's where like, um, yeah, I, like I have some friends who are, who are quite on the right that have some um, challenging conversations with me. And I think about the things I haven't thought about because it just exists in a different paradigm in some yeah. ways. And and that's really healthy for me. And I feel I feel called to engage in the nuance of that conversation, but um fiercely hold my ground for what I feel convicted on. Um, um so James, I would like to just ask a question then actually. Um so an example I remember from my time at Laid Law when I did a paper which was looking at social transformation, and social transformation isn't just mission work or like you know ngos humanitarian work it's more of actually a faith-based orthopraxis a faith-based um, methodology which is actually saying how is you know holistic transformation involved in what we do and it's as much as actually a lot of what you're saying not just about giving it's also about what you receive because it's definitely cyclic in two way um anyway um one of the things that stayed with me from that particular paper was that um, Mick Duncan, who is a uh, New Zealand-based minister in the Baptist Church. Tony can give a bit of context, and I'll come back to my yep. example. He is. He is a, a. I think he's down Wanganui way now. He used to be down um, uh, South Auckland that way. Him and Ruby. They used to. They done mission slums of Manila um, years ago. Um, went in there, sort of very. Um, Western eyes went in there, but it wasn't until they lost a child that in the slums that the people of the slums like you're one of us now. Mm. You're you're a part of this now, and they were fully embraced. And um, yeah, so Mick's got a background much like mine. He, he was a hippie though. I was ne I was listen to me, people. I was never a hippie, um, but <laughs> Mick. Mick was a hippie waster and some Christians got hold of him off of the streets of Christchurch, I think it was, and 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 loved on him and looked after him and and sort of almost brought him back to life in in Christ. And mm -hmm. uh, yep, I've got a couple of his books here, Wild Ones and Alongsiders. Great books, great man. Mm -hmm. Great man. Good, good, good books, but mm. great man, and and I think his heart is just for people, people, people. That's mm. that's what. No matter where they are, people, people, people. Just mm. get alongside, yeah. Yeah. connect, yeah. Mm. share. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. so Mick and this like it was in a guest lecture. He came and did it laid law, but this one video clip he talked about the paradigms of the Christian right and the Christian left. Right, that are within church culture. There is not necessarily so political but actually what our orthopraxis focuses and like the christian right typically has an individualist perspective which actually says you know it's about soteriology it's about salvation it's about actually preparing for the next life but the christian left typically has this idea of it saying uh it's about um 
social justice. It's about activism. It's about the least of these, you know, it's like, and his point was actually saying, you know, to which extent is your church tradition one or the other? And actually does the radical way of Christ actually involve something of a balance of both? Like, uh, as well as actually kind of asking your thoughts on kind of those ideas, which we've teased out a little bit. I mean, you you, you champion a number of causes, uh, James, though Mm. I am seeing some some connections and parallels, wondering if you could draw them together. We think like marginalization and oppressed and oppressor relationships, (laughs) third and two thirds world, you know, refugeeism, um, Mm. political well activism, welfare Mm. and well-being. Yeah, Yeah, like these are all things that I could think we could put either end of the spectrum or on both, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, it's like, <laughs> if you could tell, like, what are the similar or different convictions you have for why these causes are important to you? Yeah. Um, that's a really, really good question. Um, one th- thought um, to start with is um, theologian that I really love, Ched Myers, talks about how an early church heresy was docetism, the idea that Jesus was um, fully spiritual and not human at all. And he said that if we limit our Christology to um, our idea of Jesus, to his death and resurrection, you know, essentially to personal salvation, um, then we have a functionally docetic Christology. Mm. meaning that in function we have limited Jesus to being fully spiritual and not human. Um, Therefore, the full experience is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Um, And then that changes the lens of how you view um, the Great Commission. Go and make people you know, go and make disciples, teach yeah, them to do good. it. You know what I've done, blah, blah, blah. The, the Great Commission is um, is very, very different if you view Jesus as simply his death and resurrection. Mm, yeah, um, without a doubt. I would push it one step further yeah. and say mm. life, death, resurrection, exaltation. Uh, mm, 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 mm. The whole thing, even the... the um, the coming in the first place, actually appearing, God yeah, appearing yeah. in the chaos, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. being born into the experience of ha- humanity, being fully human, getting destroyed by humanity, coming back to life, but then exalting above all of it and saying, you're coming with me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The whole thing. The whole yeah, thing. Yeah, the whole thing. The whole thing. And I think... um. So for me, that's like a very big thing, you know, and, um, you know, I've been to a lot of churches, like I remember as a teenager, like going to see like traveling people that supposedly had um, anointing of healing and stuff like that. And like, and, you know, I saw people's legs grow and I know like spiritual chiropractor or whatever, like, I, like, I, I believe in that stuff, you know, like I believe that, um, <laughs> That, I haven't he, I haven't heard that healing, analogy before. It's spiritual like, chiropractor. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like I've 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 seen that stuff happen and I believe in it like 100 percent But then like when you read the stories of and yeah, like you read the stories of Jesus meeting a man on the outskirts of the city who can't enter because he has leprosy. Mm. Jesus heals him and says, Go and show yourself to the priest. Go and, like, get yourself be made clean, like, verify that you're clean or whatever. That Ritualistically clean, yeah. Yeah. The greatest dimension of that healing was social. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, the greatest restored, dimension. His status within yeah. society. Far, far greater than the physical healing was the social mm. healing that took place. Mm. And once I grasped that, I'm like... Sorry. Why are we like? <laughs> Sorry. Like, why are we um, sitting, praying, hoping to see miracles when we can make those miracles happen every day? You know, oh, right. and that's yeah. yeah. 
I love that 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 happens. But the the greatest miracle that happened there was that this man met God. Mm. Yeah, I'll be yeah, I'll be challenged <laughs> by that. Yeah, yeah. he totally. met I'll, God, I'll... and God transformed everything. Um, yeah. That would be my and and my hope. Mm. Whatever you do, whatever I do, Jared, Caleb, any other Christian pe- person of faith, uh, even people that aren't of faith that don't realize mm. that God is somehow doing something in the world and wants to bring people into relationship to transform everything about their being, everything. About yeah, them. yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. My hope. Yeah, I take that hundred cool. percent. I think I just grew up where yeah. people only read that as like a <laughs> yeah yeah as, as like a a, a yeah. physical like yeah, yeah. miracle miracles meant physical healing it's, but yeah. once i once i realized the a deeper dynamic that was going on mm. i'm like i could do that i, I can invite yeah. someone over for dinner that Sweet. you know you yeah. know all, all that stuff i'm like that to me that just makes the gospels and living out the great commission of being disciple, doing as Jesus taught to do. Yeah. So much more practical. Yeah. Like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll still pray for healing. Uh, and like, I'll, I'll happily pray for healing for like, for, for physical stuff. But like, I'm far more likely to go, oh, but actually socially, this person's excluded mm. and I can include them, you know? And yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's where for me i get really like i get if you want to annoy me talk about the social gospel like oh that's just the social gospel i'm like no we're talking about the whole gospel you know and you're like other people have limited it to to these other things and i guess that's the thing about engaging the nuance and the full conversation and the problem of the paradigm of christian left christian right is because what we're talking about is wholeness and some people are just talking about this. Some people are just talking about this. Um, you know, I, I guess in the, some ways, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go. Caleb. Um, yeah. No, I, I guess in some ways it's kind of like the theories on the atonement. We have, um, you know, the idea of uh, the sacrificial love. We have the idea of, penal substitution we have these different ideas and and they're not necessarily conflicting but they are all important parts and they all come together as this understanding of the atonement Mm. and in the same way like you're saying there's the social aspect there's the physical aspect there's the spiritual aspect and all of them are brought together in christ yeah to restore us physically restore us socially to restore us spiritually mm. yeah well eternally I, yeah mm. well i wonder if there's then sometimes there's the because we we find it easy to other we find it easy to be comfortable we find it easy it's like here's mm. my nice neat little worldview and it looks like this and it all fits together like we oh, what was my trainer for uh it, it's it's like you know there's that fear sometimes by actually saying that uh, the entirety of a view uh, en- encompasses everything that we feel like we lose something in the process. You know, we're like, we're, yeah, oh, we're diluting yeah. it. We're diluting actually, you know, we're a, a modernist hope, you know, actually means that the nature of truth being like, you know, all truth is true. And then it's like, actually, but what about truths that are mutually exclusive? That's, that's a pro- problem there. Right. Uh, mm. I'm teasing out some of this thing. We're having some good conversation around this. Mm. Like, like, um, where would you say then, James, is the line between being too pharisaical about orthodoxy, too pharisaical yeah. about orthodoxy, and being too liberal about orthodoxy in the promotion of orthopraxis? What would you say to that? Good question. Um, I think the thing I always come back to is the idea of... Um, uh, and I can't remember who in church history said this, you know, but like in the essentials, unity and the non-essentials, charity and, oh, sorry, in, in liberty and in all things, charity. Um, and 
in some ways. <laughs> Tony, you didn't say that. <laughs> Are you one of the early church fathers, Tony? Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think in um, some yeah, ways on, we should Gina be able to just park. <laughs> yeah. I think we should be able to park some of the essentials. Mm. And I think there should be far more charity mm. in the non-essentials. Mm-hmm. You know, like woman in leadership, like yeah, <laughs> woman leadership is, is, is that an essential? I great question. I would say that's more secondary, uh, and for and, some, and and, and, and essential that would be essential. Uh, it, essentials, it, it, essentials by definition would be mm, non-parkable. Mm, yeah, yeah. So I think because like there some are things... people in in mm. so, so the church is broad. The church yeah, is yeah, really yeah. broad. Depending where you are in what church you're in, and there are multiple churches within the church, mm-hmm. you can take an LBG situation at one end, and it, everything in there will be essential. Whereas if mm. you go to another church tithing will be essential and for yeah. some people in other church neither of them mean anything they're, yeah, they're, yeah. but some people will backflip to to get their point on on some mm. position and yeah, yeah. and I, th- I think the thing with the talking about like what's essential what's non-essential like i think we can agree on like the creeds and you know all these things that were like agreed on very very early on and then there are some things that people feel passionate about and i'm like that's cool. Like woman in leadership. You don't want woman in leadership. Sweet. Like, I'm just not going to come to your church. That's like, go like, <laughs> like go do your thing, you know? And um, then like uh, the sad thing for me is like, if you, um, if you ask someone why that they see like the verses about why women shouldn't be in leadership and eldership and all those things they explain to you all this cultural context about um you know oh timothy wasn't meaning this you know he's speaking to the people of the time all these things like that and then i'm like okay then let's talk about romans one like where um paul's talking about same-sex relationships let's have the exact same conversation it's like no 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 like you can't have like to me i'm like denominations are splitting over this like whether Mm -hmm whether someone can hold hands with another guy, like to, to me, I'm just like, man, can, can we just agree on like, what are the, like, can we just get around like, around like Jesus and what he's calling us to. And like, to, to me, like, and I'm not, I'm not starting. I'm not meaning um, to start a conversation here, but what I'm meaning to go is like, I, f- in terms of, orthodoxy and orthopraxy all those sorts of things i feel like we're creating enormous rifts over things that are potentially non-essential oh and if you think yeah most things are non-essential um (laughs) at the end of the day what's what's essential is 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 christ that is the yeah 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 yeah. but it's when it's where we stand and view christ from it's our starting place, what what we've been saved from, and the journey of each individual. Is then we start grouping up, and then we start ganging up, and then we start having wars over yeah. it. And it's yeah, just yeah. Like, yeah. I I cannot see there will ever be a time where there will be agreement across the church until Jesus turns up mm. and we all shut up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And something I something I like is that like I went to a church that literally brought in a um a mediator to mediate the conversation around LGBT stuff within the leadership of the church. And where the leadership of the church landed and came back to the church, they're like, we went through all this mediation, we interviewed all these people in the church, all this different stuff. Where we came to us, we have diverse opinions on this, and that's okay. And as a church, we like, and I'm like, cool. Like at least, we're, like, cool. Like we've decided that it's okay to have diverse opinions on a non-essential of faith. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and yeah. that's where I, 
I think um, the thing around orthodoxy, orthopraxy is that um, people are selective in their fundamentalism and their orthodoxy at <laughs> times. Um, and time. then, and then they sometimes select um, things that are potentially radically non-essential. Mm. Um, and by doing so, they exclude um, people from their church. Um, so, yeah, I'm not like, um, uh, I'm just I'm just passionate about everyone feeling like they have a place in the kingdom because they do. Um, and it doesn't mean all things go. It means well, like, yeah. let's, you know, let, let's let's radically agree on the essentials. Yeah. Well, yeah, but like, like you say, not, not not all, not necessarily all things go because everyone has a place in the kingdom, and God's grace may transform them away from certain things, mm. depending on what it is, you know. Totally, and, and I, they I, they have so, that place that God 100%. is getting ready for them. And I feel like in a in a faith that has opposing truths it's really healthy for me to be confronted by people that have more weight towards the opposing truth you know that that i hold more dearly and then i feel like um personally growing up only ever hearing about the physical dimension of a miracle like I feel this weight and like growing up only hearing the nice Psalms mm -hmm. or like only having the end of Psalms quoted, not the like first two thirds that are like, God, where are you? Um, has brought me into a place where I'm like, I feel called to bang the drum of like stare at the pain of the world and don't look away. Like that's where I'm like, that's where I feel a hundred percent called to. Is everyone called to that place? Definitely not. But there need to be people that I think are called to this place. And I think there are people that are called to like, like I feel really confronted when I'm around people that are like, man, like everything's so beautiful. Like God's so good. Like, you know, I had the best meditation today and stared at a flower, you know, like, like I'm like, oh man, that's like, I need that as well. Like it's the opposing truth that I should be confronted by. Um, and I, I have a natural inclination and a God-given calling towards the pain and, and suffering of the world. And I feel like I need to, you know, so like I, I'm not I'm not saying like, oh, airy-fairy, everything's all good, like be anything you want to be. Um, but I think it's okay that there's like radical diversity in the church and radical diversity in, in human experience. You know, you know what I mean? Like, I, like it's similar to like how I resonate really deeply with music, like on a, on a level that like, it's, it, I'm constantly engaged with music, constantly thinking about music. Like when I'm like, when Jen is like, can you do the dishes? I'm like, awesome. There's an album I want to listen to. Like, you know, it's just, everything is to me is like music, but for other people, friends i know like visual visual arts and all these other forms of art like uh, like i look at a painting i'm like that's kind of cool like sweet like you did some dots and it looks nice whereas like music <laughs> Thank you. yeah <laughs> <laughs> one dot really one yeah, dot yeah, yeah. it counts it counts yeah. <laughs> uh, do, do you know what i mean like people are called to all different things in life and that's totally like not in a oh anything goes airy fairy like yeah but to a point like if we can agree on the essentials can we can we agree that that what you listen to isn't really music <laughs> come on uh, yeah if you want to really yeah. annoy james if you want to really <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Insulting our guests, insulting i've been our pleasant guests. this whole time tony but um uh, we've heard that one before <laughs> can i can i can i tease it out just to yeah I, I wonder if actually some of the ideas i'm actually thinking about is like you know paul's passage on the body of christ right which he picks up in uh corinthians and romans right like two instances i feel like romans is right one of the other passages is wrong 
Anyway, the ecclesiology. I'm a theologian that's too tired, so I'm going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the ecclesiology of such a passage <laughs> definitely reflects what you're saying. That actually, in the church, we say to each other, "We have no need of you. We have no need of you." You know, but actually, both are needed, and mm. clearly within the wider work of what God is up to in this world, which, man, I cannot wait to get to heaven and, he like, you know, to actually hear about all that, to actually yeah. share stories around the campfire, you know, actually have the kind of, like, what was God up to and what was he doing? Yeah. Like, where, how did yeah. this all connect? How did all the dots connect? But just in the meantime, just that actually the person who looks at the leaf and meditates for an hour and it's like, I contemplated this, and the person is like, mm. I'm going to bang the drum and, like, look at the pain of the world mm. and don't look away and the body of christ both are necessary both are needed you know like yeah I, I, th I wonder if there's something in that to actually say while we are comfortable sometimes with categories and god has a clearly has a different perspective on this matter and the more our mind becomes like that of christ the more we're going to be actually transformed to see the world as it should be and be transformed in our actual response to it, um, which I see in your story, mm. man, which I inherently see in your story. Like, um, mm. and I value that about you and I honor that in you and I thank God for what he's doing in you through that process. And it's been such a thank pleasure you. to, I'm such been such a pleasure to hear about all that detail. Um, my friend, like, uh, we don't want to take too much more of your time. You know, we're all, you know, fathers of children. Right. Yeah. As well. <laughs> um, Two things I do want to just actually kind of say, I'll say this ahead of time, edit this out. So this is giving you time to think. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to plug anything, you know, giving you that space yep. to actually do, uh, to do so at, towards the end, edit, mm -hmm. this, edit this in. <laughs> um, I'd love to actually say, you've mentioned Matthew 25, just as closing out, are there some key scriptural ideas, verses or passages that inform your discipleship and if you mm. could say anything like uh, what would you want to say to, to the church imagine you have that platform right now to actually speak to your context you know australian church yeah. new zealand church what would you want to say to the church about the why of what we do things and how we could improve you've said a lot of that but if you could like yeah. if you mm. could get it down to like a couple of key things for you like your heart cries it were yeah a couple of key things um and yeah, doubling back to some of the things I've already mentioned, uh, Matthew in in Matthew twenty five, sheep and the goats, Jesus um, was the least of these, mm. and uh, I think if people truly want to encounter Christ, um, they should go seek out those spaces where they are with with the least of these, and um, helpfully, um, the Bible gives us a list of who those people are. So. I'm like, if you want a fresh um, revelation of the person of Jesus, go and seek out those spaces um, and those people. Um, the other one would be around the social dimension of healing. I think it, um, it changes how we begin to, to look at things. I went to a church that, um, that asked the trans person not to be in the worship band and that forced them that person then decided to leave the church. Um, and at the time I was like, yeah, like they're not living the way they ought to be. That's not the kingdom of God. You know, like, and I'm like, did we just send them to the gates of the city? You know, did we just say that they are not someone that could lead us in worshiping the God that created all of us? Like, you know, like I think I would just go not like the kingdom of god is like singing kumbaya around a fire but like at what points are we creating places of of healing where people are, are healed and welcomed in, into mm -hmm. community with people and with god and at what points are we the people banishing you know at what point are we the pharisees sending people to the outskirts of the city um and I think we should wrestle with that. Um, yeah, I would say those will be my two big things. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, 
and and I'm sure we'd all have different takeaways on where that where that is. And but mm. like you say, it's it's an important distinction to try and make. Um, it's an important discussion to have and and to reflect on within yourself and in discussion with God. Mm, totally to find where you know where that is. Um, is that sending that person to the gates? Is that you know? Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's a a big big discussion to be had. Well, I think... totally. And I pose I pose it as a question so that people can reflect, not as a, mm. a like not as a this isn't a hundred percent like this is the way it is. Yeah. Like I, I pose it as a question as like we should wrestle with that, you know, like. And if and if you land on a yeah. different place to me, but you've seriously considered it and you've engaged with those people and engaged with their humanness, um, mm. and done so in a way that offers them dignity, and mm. then like all power to you if you land somewhere different to me. But like mm. I think, I think we should be confronted by the hard questions. You know, at what point are we the are we the Pharisees? Um, you know, at what at what point are we the in the story of the Good Samaritan? There are the people that walk, you know, walk past the Good Samaritan, but there are people that walk to the other side of the road to like purposefully avoid them. You know, at what point are we the, you know, the the priests the doing that? You know, like mm. I I think we should be confronted by those parts of those stories, mm. not just like oh great we're the Good Samaritan. It's like no, like <laughs> I think we're probably we're closer to the priest quite often. Like mm. I know personally, mm. I am. I, I often try to avoid the suffering of other people, even as someone that feels called to engage with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I love that as inherent in what you are saying is that spiritual discipline of, you know, fellowship, you know, fellowship mm -hmm. with the church, you know, iron sharpens iron, talk with people who agree with you and do disagree with you, you know, or inversely yeah, yeah. that you are for them. And also that spiritual mm -hmm. discipline in all things prayerful and all things communing with God. It's like, because these are the things that actually God has gifted to us, the means by which actually these, these questions are worked out. That's part of the discipleship. It's, it's individual, but it certainly isn't at the expense or at the absence of the collective, right? We are mm -hmm. being actually, the, this is the model of actually how to do faith that God has left us with. Eh? And I, I feel that so inherent and, everything you've described and i love that i, I, lo I love you for that bro mm. um yeah, cheers i i'd love to just before we close out a practice in our discipline is <laughs> is to actually pray for our uh, guest uh, so i hope you'd uh, yeah, be great. happy for us to do that um mm. and additionally um also if you had anything you'd like to plug actually giving you that time is there anyone you'd like to shout out anyone you'd like to say hey people should be aware of this organization because we're all about networking holy spirit yeah. breathing on that and two or three gathered yeah yeah um i would just say there's um if you want none one another kiwi podcast um that's um worth checking out is there's the 21 elephants podcast um with spanky moore and scotty reeve which i think is just like a really really good listen and they tease out like a lot of the um like i've had the um privilege of journaling, journeying, journeying alongside Scotty in um, so many ways. So um, it's almost like if you want to continue pulling on the thread of some of the things I've had to say, um, that's another good place to start. No, I love that. Thank you, man. Um, yeah. Would anyone else like to kick us off, by the way? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll... Yeah. Mm. Cool. Beautiful and wonderful God. We, we thank you for this, uh, uh, for this evening we thank you and we praise you uh, for bringing us together we especially thank you tonight for uh, for bringing our brother James uh, to us and, and the discussion that, that we we know you've been present in Lord mm. um, obviously Lord we 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 pray that you continue to bless james in his in his mission and in, in his work as you so clearly have been doing uh, i love his heart that, that you have given him to see uh, the oppressed be lifted up to see the marginalized know that they have a place in your kingdom and 
that they are worthy of love. Lord, thank you for the the mind, the, the inquiring mind and, and heart that you've placed in James. And we pray that you continue to, to stoke that fire um, for not just truth, but also love and mercy mm. and justice. Lord, we, we thank you that you've been doing so thus far, and we, we pray that you continue to do so, mm. uh, so that more lives may be changed with your beautiful and wonderful and redemptive grace. Mm. Lord, mm. we thank you. And uh, we pray these uh, these conversations may open hearts and not, not fall upon uh, hearts of stone, but hearts of flesh, Lord. Mm. In Jesus' um, mighty name.